Hey everybody, welcome back to Jim's Garage. This is a video I've been wanting to do for a long time. I'm gonna take you through how I'm gonna build out my new home lab using some of these. That's the MS-01 and not just one, three of them. But before we get onto that, let's take a quick recap of how I ended up here. So as you know on my channel, I've been having terrible internet for years. I've been on basically a copper phone line with 80-20 which has just made life hell not only for creating these videos but also spinning up clusters and just general work life in general because you're sharing so much bandwidth with the rest of your house. The good news is Virgin Media recently fibered our area and now I can get two gigabit symmetrical internet. So yeah, going from 8020 to two gig up and down has been an absolute game changer. But for those who don't know, it also causes a few issues. Most of my existing kit was only one gigabit, so it meant that I could not take advantage of those full speeds on a single device, and I wanted to get down on the power, noise, and basically the heat as well from my existing server kit. That's where the MS-01s came in. So the installation went pretty smoothly. They came in, they dug a little trench in my garden, that went into the house, and then out the back of that came the fiber. Now we get on to the interesting bit of what does my home lab look like? Well, I really wanted to build a three node Proxmox cluster and I wanted to then be able to spread my Kubernetes clusters and my various VMs over those clustered devices. And I also wanted to have Ceph set up for replication and HA storage. That's why it was really important to choose the MS-01. Now, I'm not gonna provide a detailed overview or review of that device. You should go and check out some of the usual suspects. But what I wanna focus on is why I chose it and why it's perfect for my use case. So, as a quick summary, this thing packs a 13900H. There are 12900H and 12600Hs, but pretty much all of those are beefy CPUs. Again, it's going down that new trend of using laptop CPUs in a desktop small form factor PC and that comes with the ability to have up to 96 gigabytes of DDR5 RAM and it also supports three NVMe slots albeit they're all different speeds which is a little bit confusing but the PS2 resistance is probably the built-in X710s these are two SFP plus ports on the back two 2.5 gigabit NICs courtesy of an Intel i226 one of those with remote management it's a little bit flaky, but hopefully it will improve. And also, this is the cool bit, two Thunderbolt 4 ports, which I'm actually using in a ring network between all of the devices to create an internal sort of backhauled clustered network that runs at about 2.6, 2.7 gigabytes per second. So ironically, this is the fastest network connection on the device. Oh. Did I also mention it comes with a times eight PCIe four slot as well? Yeah, that's pretty awesome. Now, don't get me wrong, and as some of the reviews have picked up, this isn't perfect. With getting one of these devices, I'm sacrificing full ECC support. However, because of DDR5, I am getting the on-memory support. I'm also limited to 96 gigs, which shouldn't be a problem because I've got three of these devices but that RAM isn't cheap compared to secondhand server memory. Also, there's things like a single PSU, and hopefully, and this is more broadly across the device, there's decent build quality in here, things like the capacitors, etc. I hope these things last a long time. I know that my Dell over there, the one that I'm currently retiring, that could probably run for 15, 20 years and not break a sweat. The other thing that we need to be considerate of is the actual size itself, which almost feels like they've gone hell-bent on making this thing so small that it's actually had a detrimental impact on its usability. That times eight slot on the back, um, yeah, it's quite small. You can only fit a half height card in there and it's obviously gonna be limited to the power that you can provide through it through the device, albeit you could externally power something as well. I'm not sure how I'm gonna run these things long-term. They look quite nice as they are, but I'm probably gonna run them naked so you can just slip the sleeve off the top of them and I might just strap a couple of Noctua fans. And then what I'll do is then put that in one of my existing server cases that I'm gonna retire. I'll put a load of Noctua fans on the front and the back and that should give it full airflow right the way through the device. 
As I mentioned as well, those NVMe drives, they're a bit interesting. You can actually put a large U.2 drive in there and it comes with a bracket adapter, which is quite nice, albeit I find those drives to be quite expensive still. So I'm gonna to opt to go with the 980 Pro, the Samsung, in the times four by four slot. That's gonna give me speeds of, well, maximum theoretical speeds of seven and a half gigs per second. That will be more than enough for installing Proxmox on and running my virtual machines. Now, yeah, in an ideal world, I'd want to separate out the operating system and the VMs, but because I've got three, I'm more open to a bit of risk. And obviously, with things like Ceph and backups that I'm going to put onto this, I should be okay given a node failure. Now the Ceph itself, I'm not going to be putting on that NVMe drive. It's a bit of a waste. Like I said, it's going to be about 2.6 gigabytes per second over that Thunderbolt 4 connection. So I'm actually going to use one of my existing NVMe drives. Remember, I've got quad NVMe on my Dell R730. I'm going to be taking one of those out and putting them in each respective Minis Forum MS01. I'll probably put those in the 4x3 slot, which would give me 3.5 gigs three and a half gigs per second maximum throughput and that's obviously still higher than the 2.6 gigabytes per second so it feels like it's a much better use of that transfer speed now that will be my Ceph node so my VMs will run on the 980 Pro that's my fastest drive and then all the replicated storage will be on that slower drive albeit still fast enough to do real-time replication and what's really cool I've not figured this out myself. There's a load of guides up there. So to get that working, I followed a handy guide online. Do go check that out and give it a start, especially if you've got some Thunderbolt 4 small form factor PCs lying around. This is a really great way to expand your network capabilities. And I was getting, like I said, 2.6 gigabytes per second, um, very low pings as well. There were some high retries, but again, a retry is not a failure, it just had to retry. This was much higher than I was getting over networking connections, so I would get typically zero or one max retry throughout the whole test. This was throwing up about 200 every hop, but it still didn't result in any downtime, any data corruption, etc., and it still passed the test. So having a look at the actual network diagram itself, I'm gonna have it set up like this. I'm gonna have three minis forums, all together. They're gonna to be on that backhaul network using the Thunderbolt 4 connections. That's gonna be an internal only network just within Proxmox. Nothing else will have access to that. That will run things like the migration between clusters. It will run things like spinning up new machines, migrating nodes, etc., and also critically that Ceph infrastructure. Now that accounts for the two Thunderbolt ports, but as I said, there's still two two and a half gig NICs and there's still two 10 gig SFP plus ports. Now, what I'm gonna do with those is each one of those nodes will take one of the SFP plus ports and that'll plug directly into my Unify switch for 10 gig. So all my VMs are basically gonna use that and they're gonna be a virtual bridge with all the VLANs and etc. on those. That will go directly into the switch. So theoretically, all of those VMs will be sharing a 10 gig NIC. Now, later down the road, I might go down SRIOV. That's the single root input output virtualization. Haven't covered that on the channel yet, and I will get into that. Think of that as basically like a computer and VMs. You're chopping a computer up into lots of virtual ones. It's the same thing, but at the hardware device level. So effectively, you take a network card and you split it into lots of virtual network cards. The VM thinks it's the real device, all the drivers, etc., work. You get all the hardware offloading capabilities, acceleration on the chips, etc. So theoretically, you should get more performance than having a virtual bridge. The downside to that is obviously any kind of pass through and stuff like that, you're not going to get failover and replication. With that in mind, I'm not going to get that anyway, even though I've spoken about it, because I'm actually planning on using the GPU on the MS01. It actually has quite a nice Iris XE, thanks to it being a quite powerful high-end laptop CPU. I'm gonna pass that through into my cluster. So that means that certain nodes on my cluster or certain VMs are gonna take full advantage of GPU acceleration. Great for things like Plex or Jellyfin or anything else that requires some GPU acceleration. 
Also, I could do SRIOV on that and it is possible. So again, that's something I'll be covering in later videos. Now, one issue I do have and I'm having to come to terms with is I won't be able to run an HA firewall. Previously, I've run Sophos XG in high availability mode, virtualized within Proxmox, and that's been rock solid. Now, that uses PPoE internet, so effectively, we can share the single WAN connection between both firewalls. That's not gonna be possible in my new setup because it's just not how the fiber connection works. I've had about two weeks of blowing my mind with fiber and how complicated it is, the various different standards. I was not ready for this. But what I've actually done now is migrated over to OpenSense. That was a fun little story. Maybe I'll get into that another time. Essentially, I had a botched install that I didn't realize and one of the upgrades for DNS wasn't working. So all my DNS was failing. I was pulling my hair out. But a few reverts back and then upgrades and it all sorted itself out. And I'm glad to say it's all working now. But it does mean that because I've only got the single fiber connection, I can't do that split that I did previously. So I do have a problem now because I'm doing hardware pass through as well on that firewall that if one of my nodes goes down, my main node, that means my internet's gonna go down, which is a problem. Obviously, because now I have the network backhaul with the Thunderbolt ports, those won't go down. So that's actually quite a good thing to have. But I do need to think about certain scenarios where I'm gonna have to reboot my firewall node with the VM on it and what that's gonna to do to my network. I still need to have a think about that. My plan is probably <laughs> quite manual. I'm gonna have the exact same firewall spun up on all of these devices and as and when required, I'll have the config ready. I can just flash it onto the other node with the same config, pull the SFP out on the LAN cable and just stick them in and fingers crossed, it should work. One other thing that's pretty cool is I run Frigate, as you know, and it has the Coral TPU in it. Now, each of these Minis Forums MSO1s has an E key for the Wi-Fi card. Now, I don't need these Wi-Fi cards. They're taking up extra power. And it also gives me an E slot that I can handily put the Coral TPU into, which is awesome. Technically, I don't need that anymore because it now supports uh, Intel iGPUs. And as I've mentioned, I can pass those through to a virtual machine. So I'm in a bit of a quandary as to whether I use the Coral TPU or the Intel iGPU. I'll do some power stats and we'll see where we get to. Speaking of power, what's it like? Well, I'm having a look right now it's pulling 130 watts. Now, if you saw my tweet earlier in the week, I had these things at idle, so just running Proxmox, and they were running at about 40 watts, which is pretty impressive. Why is it so high? Well, that's because I've been tinkering, and in the next video, I'm gonna show you how I now have this configured. Quick spoiler, they all have Proxmox running on them now. I've got my Kubernetes cluster running on it now, and that's why the power draw is around 140 watts. Now, bear in mind, at the moment, before I did this, I had three PCs running. They were running at over 500 watts for the same workload. So I basically got a three, two and a half times reduction in power, but more importantly, I've got over mm, six times the performance. So my Dell plus my other two machines were giving me a pass mark of about 20K. These things, about 90, 95K. So amazing performance, amazing power efficiency. It would be great to see some AMD variants in the same form factor. Hopefully they will come soon, but I'm happy with my purchase for now. So now I have the hardware set up. I've also got my fast internet. That also opens up some new options for me. Like I've mentioned before, having fast internet means I can do more cloud things. It means I can do some co-location and it also opens up the opportunity of doing more meshy networky things, wire guard and head scale, etc. with my friends, which is pretty cool. So we can start to share resources. They've already got multi gigabit connections as well. So now I can join the club. In the next video, I'm gonna show you how I set up this cluster 
and also some of the configurations, some of the nuances. I'll focus on things like how I set up the Thunderbolt ring, what the actual internals of my devices look like, so the hardware configuration, and I'll also then show you how I spun up my cluster, copy things over, because I think it's interesting to understand some of the complexities of migrating over to new hardware. I found out again first time the joys of having no DNS server. I went to move over my Pi hole, it wiped out both, I had it set to the latest and obviously my cluster couldn't pull the new image because it was trying to use itself as a DNS server to pull its own container. I had to then dig into Kubernetes, change the resolver, all those sorts of things. So hopefully you can avoid some of those pitfalls. And I also decided to upgrade to traffic version three, which caused some fun because it's only been out a couple of weeks and there's some things, or maybe it's just for my setup or K3S specifically, that require some tweaks. There's additional config files that weren't in the instructions that I had to deploy in order for it to use valid SSL certificates. So I'll share all that with you. Anyway, I hope you found that useful. I'm loving the new setup. I'm really looking forward to getting everything onto these devices, off my existing, powering all that stuff down and saving a ton of money. Now, on the money front, yeah, I've got a few years before I get some ROI, but I think it's going to be worth it for the performance boost I've got and the expandability of these devices in such a small form factor. Anyway, thanks for watching. Take care and I'll see you in the next one.